welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us again today. I'm Adam Cole uh, Grant with Grant Park Academy of the Arts. And today we're going to be talking to Mr. Dave Pickett. But before we get started, I want to thank a couple people that I always thank. We first want to thank uh, BrassAndWinds.com, a Quinn the Eskimo company. Uh, these are good friends of ours who help us with all our brass and woodwind needs, and they can also help you. If you have any questions, please uh, give them a call or check them out at www.brasswinds.com. We are Grant Park Academy of the Arts and grantparkarts.com. Come learn with us. We do online and in-person music instruction, and we'd love to work with you. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, a friend of mine, somebody that you have probably never heard of, and yet I guarantee you have seen his work. He is a colorist. And uh, in, before we get any further, I'd like to say hello, Dave. Dave Pickett, please say hello. Good morning, Adam. Uh, been looking forward to this for a while. I'm excited. Thank you. Me also. Uh, I think probably the best thing to do would be to explain what I meant by that. How is it that people have seen your work and yet they, they, they don't know you? What is a colorist? Well, it's, that's a great question. And, and it's funny because there's a bit of a beef within the colorist community. Yeah, why don't people know who we are? And there's another part that's like, yeah, as long as they don't know us, you know, we're, we're in the clear. We're in these dark rooms. But, <laughs> it, you know, in the, in the process of making movies and TV and content, and as, as well even as the, the current streaming content, there's a sort of a relegated pipeline of, of uh, craftsmen, craftspeople, who do their specialty and hand off, hand off, hand off. So the director, sort of the grand poobah, the, uh, and then I uh, zone in on the director of photography, and these days a digital image t technician, a DIT, uh, communicate with them, liaise with them, and our job are the imagery wing of these basically small businesses, which are feature film productions. And we, uh, I take the footage that is shot in a feature film, let's say, and spend all night or all day uh, making sure that all the imagery is uh, correct, healthy, the right temperature, the right white balance to start with, optimized, in focus, all of those types of things. And then I start to adjust the inherent variations that occur in nature, shooting, light that changes. You'll, you'll notice it with me in this interview as the sun goes in and out of cloud. All of those kind of things are a, uh, a way to unify the imagery so that you can then display it and, and go further and take a, a creative or a treatment. Uh, so there's like one step of making sure it's all healthy and, and, and in great shape and you can tell a story with it. After all of that, we come back and do it again, which is called a final pass, and really sit with the select edited film or commercial or television show and go back over it again with a fine tooth comb, really audition subtleties. And yeah, we spend our, all of our lives in dark rooms and our credits are way, way, way at the back of crawls that no one even reads anymore. Okay. Or so never, never did. That was a great description of what you do, but you really, what you did was you dropped us in the jungle and said, hey, let's look around the jungle. Uh, I don't think uh, there was so much jargon there, so many words. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. That's what I'm here for. Can you... Um, I mean, I, I could probably explain in a big way, but is there like maybe one sentence you could give us? What does a colorist do? Changes pictures from one thing to something else uh, with a bit of artistic input him, or herself, but mainly bringing the director's vision to the screen, translating oh. it from the set to the exhibition screen. So you basically change the colors of images for artistic reasons. Absolutely. Technical and artistic. Now, I know from having watched your work for a long time, you've brought me into an awareness of how important it is. And now I can't watch a video without thinking about color. Thank you very much. But um, I, why is that? Tell someone else. Uh, some of our folks watching may want to explore this as a career option or may just maybe they'll be directors. What's so great about color? Is it that important? Without a doubt. Uh, it's been a fascinating journey for me to learn just how important it is, given that my background and my childhood was had nothing to do with the film industry. 
you know, and I discovered it later in life. I started at 25 and rather quickly, I started feeling the difference in Im that the different imagery treatments were creating a dark and foreboding or a rainy or dark uh, or queasy color greens or Martian oranges and all these things start influencing some like we've talked about kind of like spices on a meal that it changes it in a way that's distinct and usually hopefully pleasing, but you have a bunch of different dishes with the same picture. So color is important as a way to, to keep the viewer in the story without having noticeable jerks and pops and light changes and color balance changes. You just remove all of that. And then you can say, oh, now is it scary or is it happy or is it old timey or is it Western or is it avant-garde French new wave? So in order to become fluent with all of that, I've had to spend decades watching all the cinema I can. Because those types, like you said, the jargon that I don't even realize that I talk in is, you know, <laughs> is that language. So that when a client says, hey, you remember that picture and this picture and that process? Oh, absolutely. You can sort of reasonably get there. Yeah. Well, um, so it's, it's something striking me now. Um, it sounds like, uh, like when we walk around the world, you know, we've got color all around us. And yet when we watch a video of something, um, in order for us to feel like it's real or to feel like we can go in there, we have to somewhat control and simplify the color. That seems paradoxical. Am I saying that correctly? Uh, I'm not sure I either I follow or I agree. Uh, there's a, the way I heard that was that there's a limit, I guess, to uh, what we need to do to the color that we limit it in order to control. But it really is, like I mentioned before, the technical side is, is also a huge part of our role. It's the bridge between the camera department that shot a very expensive scene with, you know, actors, the whole works, and then they hand it to you. Don't mess it up, because that's a very difficult thing to recreate, if at all. And that the reports that your eyes make on the footage are the very first eyes in a critical viewing environment for the production, such that if there's any technical issues whatsoever, flicker or, uh, you know, aberrations or some mi million things, you can, you can, you're the official reporter of that. And let me tell you, they take that seriously. And you're also looking for things like overexposure or frame rate issues, all kinds of stuff. pixels dropped out. So you're kind of, backstopping all of that and you don't have the clipped issues like we were speaking to before kind of like i appear now where it's so bright it's overwhelming the camera uh you take care of all of that and then you can go and start doing the color treatment to tell the story okay. think of david fin david fincher movies for example seven or zodiac right they're kind of this greeny yellow underworld and never let you up seven it rains all the time and it's you know green and and uh, it's fantastic, you know, it's the, until someone, I guess, points it out to you or the Matrix. It was so green, like mean green. Uh, but then, then the artist comes in, the 2011 uh, best, best film was black and white. Black and white silent picture won in 2011. It's pretty amazing. Kind of goes yeah. to show you color can matter not at all. <laughs> right. You know? Well, well once it's taken out of the lot. equation. Yeah. Yeah. I guess once it's put in, once, like you, you mentioned to me in another conversation, black and white is awesome. You can do all kinds of things with light and shading. But once you bring the color in, you have to deal with it. It doesn't just take care of itself. And it's another thing I think it's, it's interesting. It's a delicate topic. We, I learned along the way that the main, my main job is to make the faces of the people on the screen not only look good look correct within the story that's being told it has influence over everything else and that also is what lighting folks tend to concentrate on and so when you when your whole job is about optimizing faces and i've had you know the good fortune of working in places like india where all the faces were uh, quite different quite darker or australia where there's a mix of complexions america certainly a mix of complexions that our skin tones really do matter in a subconscious way that is the delicate uh, political uh, topic to tread upon. But removing that aspect and realizing just how important our appearance is to our audience, 
that if you're a little jaundice looking and you look ill, it, you, you know, it, it affects things. Mm-hmm. And we spend a lot of time making sure everyone's skin tones look accurate and great. And that takes sometimes a lot of real little nuance because of, well, part of the pr- problems inherent in the process of capturing and delivering on a different display. Sure. Now, I don't know if we're going to follow through with this. I hope we are. But you had discussed the possibility of t- taking this footage that we're getting right now and yeah. coloring it so that we can see in real time what it is. Now, I don't have any idea what's, what it's going to look like when we're done, but do you want to speak to that and maybe talk sure. through what you're going to do to this and then we can see it happen? Well, you know, given that this is uh, happening in real time and based upon my, uh, my screen, I'm, I'm quite bright which is an interesting topic. I won't be able to do that much with me bright wise, but with you, I can do a lot. So what I'll do is I'll uh, sort of go through the motions on this color correcting panel, describe what's happening and uh, you'll, you'll see it, uh, you know, you'll see it change. Okay. So, so if I come into a, a scene like this with you, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get my scopes up. And I'm sorry these screens are not that visible, but I can't do this by eye alone. I have to have mathematical representations to know for certainty what's going on. <clears throat> and I would see that there's a lot of room to start you know, raising the highlights and go up a bit until you start to see things uh, get a little bright across the nose and maybe in the sky. You get to that point and you kind of tuck it right below that. Uh, and, and I also see where you could you know, bring the shadows down a little bit, maybe a little too much just to see where they are. And I tend to sort of wiggle it uh, just to sort of see where that organic bottom line is. And now I know where my top and bottom uh, are, if you will. That's my limits. And now where all the magic kind of happens is in the midtones. Um, because, of course, that's all the information that's in between our limits, top and, you know, top and bottom. So instead of using my dedicated panel for the curves, I'm going to come over here and use a, uh, a GUI. And this gets really interesting. You, you know, it goes gonzo like that and then sort of gonzo another way. And you kind of see the image tracking behind me. And yet I like, I really like this. Is that This is kind of a modern tool for colorists. Remember, we were all photochemical for so long that we had to do this with uh, strips of film to then make a, a print out of negative, you would shove a little filter to add a point of green or take it, you know, very different than I've got all this control. Um, and GUI is and graphic user interface, right? Graphic user interface, that's correct. Yeah. And, you know, of course, with us, we have uh, saturation is a big part of the, of the, uh, the game. And, you know, I like to sometimes take it all the way down to black and white, which is a great way to sort of see your picture in that other non-distracting way, as well as to take a still store of that um, to use as reference down the line so that I can really know what is white, black, and gray as I work by sort of popping that image up. And whatever hue I see in a known gray field, I know my eyes are biased and leaning the other way uh, as a part of the mind's color correction process. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pin the video to me since it's been back and going back and forth between you and me. Um, now it's stuck on me so that as okay. you talk, that way you won't have to find the frames of me. You can... Uh, Actually, yeah, that, that, that's more helpful just because we, we have a little bit better latitude in your camera and it's, I've sort of lamented this morning that given that this is sort of my neck of the woods and here I am with an overblown camera. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, I'm going to come back out and then bring that back to uh, normal saturation. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to oversaturate it. And you can start to see, yeah, maybe color, color, color. And it gets really hairy and unpleasant and amplifies the places where you're not in good shape technically. And that's why a lot of saturation tends to be a bad idea. Well, for almost all involved. But until you have a really good control of the primary red, green, and blue, interactions together a lot of saturation will show a lot of unpleasant unpleasing non-linearities so i just put it up to sort of demonstrate that a bit um and i think that's probably as far as i'd like to go with uh with touching our picture because mm-hmm. i think it's we might start to get a little 
lesson oriented or tedious, but rest assured there's quite a few more processes down the line of shaping and affecting and grabbing uh, areas by either their geographic region or shape or hue or all the different kinds of ways you can isolate an image and manipulate those to make it better. Well, I'm going to push your patience just a little bit and ask you to play with me just a touch. Okay. Uh, I, just for the fun of it, I'd like you to maybe help me work a couple scenarios. One, is it possible you can change the color of this image that I am to make it look like something really bad is going to happen to me very soon? Is that possible? Can you? I, well, yes. Yes. I mean, if, if, that, if I, that wasn't the case, then, you know, I'm doing something else for a living. Um, and, and not just me, but if you couldn't help a story that way, there were, wouldn't be that much of a use for us, right? Right. So I think, let's say, starting with where we are now, I'm going to kind of zero back out. Um, I would first would like to say, believe it or not, the way that imagery can convey a feeling is as trendy as fashion. And I learned through working internationally that you leave one country and a trend is saturated and aggressive and the other one's desaturated and flat, you're out of phase. I went to India in 09 and thought it's going to be, of course, colorful and, and everything. No, they were very desaturated. While America was going through a very saturated period again. America went super saturated 90s and then super flat earlys and comes back and it, so that's why I paused I can convey in several different eras a feeling of unease okay. one of them one of them being like you know like maybe a classic just really stick down the contrast um you know super spooky uh you know you're gonna desaturate a little bit maybe even add some uh some saturation or some sharpening to sort of gritty it up a bit. Now you're kind of looking a little hairy and uneasy and that's just with level and texture. <laughs> and I'll, what, you know, and what happens is you need to save this stuff um, because comparison is the name of the game. So I've got our original image. Now I've got that look sort of saved. I go back to the original image um, and say, okay, now I'm going to apply the, the new graded image and then I'm going to introduce a bunch of, greens and and maybe some yellows coming through and then uh all right that's a good idea i'm going to add what's called a power window or a mat or a mask which separates an image um by a shape so that i can um let's say just take right above your head a little bit and you know, kind of bring that down and force that there's a darkness coming down from the sky and not a lightness coming down from the sky and then I'll stand on top of that and say, now I'm going to really, you know, desaturate that again. And I'm going to add another note and I'm going to actually jack up that mono saturated with something else. And I've completely overridden what you look like. And then I'll, you know, I'll pop back to, there you are straight up, you know, <laughs> there you are the first time. <laughs> and here you are sort of put upon cinematically, uh, <laughs> I know. Don't look my, over your shoulder. My acting chops. There, my face is so expressive. And, and now we're back terrifying. to. Now we're back to one. Okay. Great. Thank and you. I, and I hope I hope that helps. You know, it's, we've joked about it that talking about color is like dancing about architecture. <laughs> that you you just got to see it. You know, yeah. and I I can I can talk about it because I've had to make a living communicating with clients uh, about it. But it's still, you, if I meet someone out for you know dinner and they ask, it's I learned long ago that it's just very difficult to explain it properly. Yeah, no, you're doing and, great. Um, one of the most I think revealing moments for me was when I came to visit and watched you work, and uh, you sh you turned a daytime shoot into a sunset, and I thought, oh, well, that's convenient. I mean, you don't have to shoot at sunset; you can put a sunset in a picture with color. Right. Yeah. Changing time of day or unifying time of day or changing season, turning green leaves yellow. Wow. Oh. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. yeah. Golf courses, of course, are always wanting to look perfectly green, get rid of all those yellow splotches. So there's that kind of color correction, which is restorative. You know, and then there's narrative types. Where, or, for example, if you have an episodic show that runs five, seven, eight, ten seasons, there's a cohesion to that show that you have to stick to three different 
colorist to go, you know, worked on this show and now you've got to pick it up and, and keep it going. Um, there is just, there's a lot of, probably a lot more use for us than, you know, that you would think, which going back to our opening statement, yeah, why don't more people know we do this? Right. But, you know. Do you, um, I, I happen to know how you got into this, although it's a story I'd like you to tell. Do you go to school for this? How do you learn to become a colorist? No, uh, especially in 96 when I started, there were no, uh, oh goodness, this is, uh, this is drifting over just a little bit. My apologies. There were no, uh, but there were no schools because the equipment is so expensive. Millions of dollars in 96 that schools couldn't really afford to have the stuff to work on. So the only way in was first to know somebody. And second was to, like I did, work in the tape library uh, from 1 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. for a year at Santa Monica while preparing all of these telecine and color sessions that were going on all night from all the productions that were going on all day. And while brutal, it was the school available. Uh, now, and I clear, you weren't coloring then. You were just duplicating tapes while these guys were working. Right? That's right. The entry, the entry positions were clerical or not even duplication. Duplication was the next step up. I was just <laughs> receiving stock putting barcodes on it and putting in the library raw stock that's needed, you know, the tape. And that was, but all I was, you that was your job. I was, yeah, I was a tape librarian. Overnight. And overnight, $8 an hour. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> and then you got to this and the path was? Well, uh, the first thing you try to do is get off of the graveyard shift so you can be alive. So I spent another couple of years on the daytime after I had proven myself for about a year. Uh, at night in the tape library, prepping all the assistants for all the color correction sessions that were going on that day. It's three of them, three of those rooms, five days a week, the accumulating the reps and the hours came quickly. And I stayed, of course, late, well, all day and all night a lot just to learn as much as I could. Got an actual an assistant colorist job about a year into it, uh, then changed firms. And uh, that helped me rise up in the, the, the uh, projects that I could work on because there's definitely a hierarchy. You know, what have you worked on? Who have you worked with? And just getting started with that and being still an assistant for some things, my own colorist at night for some things, overnight sopranos, dailies, and then back in for gap commercials. Remember those 90s gap commercials? Yeah. Uh, and then after about four years in Los Angeles, I recognized that if I was really going to commit to the big color career, I would have to just stay there. And that was that. Uh, but I didn't want to do that as much as I wanted to kind of explore the globe. And that time in Los Angeles really opened up everything else afterwards. I mean, it's just how fortunate we are in America that if you want to go to the global center of an industry, that it's just West, you know, it's, you don't have to move to uh, China or Africa or London like so many people have to move to LA. So I just drove out there and jumped in. Was it your intention to become a colorist when you went to LA or is that something you discovered? Yeah, it's, I think this is great. I, it was 100% color. My landlord, when I was 23, fresh out of uh, college and playing music, he was a colorist. I had never heard of it. And I lived there for a year and finally, like, what is this? And we had become friends and he took me into the studio in Atlanta and he laced up a piece of film and took me into a room like this. And as he was going through it, it was a very eureka moment that I feel like I totally get what you're doing right from the beginning. Very intuitive. It's exciting. And this is an actual job, you know, like I can, I can do this and get you know, paid. And then he had the, the wisdom to say, since you're completely green anyway, just go ahead and go to LA. You know, don't get started in Atlanta. Just go ahead. And it was scary, but I, I thought, yeah, yeah, I mean, let's do it. And, uh, that, you know, he, he, it, an interesting, his name was Richard Parker. He was a great, uh, colorist in Atlanta for many years. And he was responsible for getting me started. And then, Many years later, uh, he was stricken with uh, uh, melanoma after opening his own business in Atlanta. I was enjoying myself in Sydney at the time, working for a great uh, 
post health called Frame Set Match. And because Richard was the guy that got me going when he felt too ill to keep working and had his business, I left Sydney and came back to Atlanta and I uh, worked in his company until he died. And we held, held on for a little while in his honor, but, uh, you know, he was irreplaceable. So that was just a really interesting experience almost 20 years after this man got me started that I was able to come back and help him. End of life, but you're still helping. You know? Yeah, that's neat. Well, now I wanted to bring you on for two reasons. Uh, I wanted our community of creatives and musicians and artists to know, first of all, that this position exists, that this thing exists and what is it and why is it important? Perhaps they might want to look into it or at least be aware of it if they're interested in entering the film or television industry to know that this position exists and it's important. But there's another reason too. Um, and if folks are observant, they'll notice there's like all these guitars behind you. And that's because in addition to being a colorist, you're also a very accomplished songwriter and producer of sound, of albums. You have two wonderful albums out that I know Thank about. You. And uh, that puts you in a very unique position for somebody that's gone that far into color and that far into sound. And uh, I'd like you to talk, if you could, with me about the connections between sound and color. For instance, if we wanted to talk about mastering or even if we just wanted to talk about songwriting in general. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, uh, how, how deeply these two disciplines interconnect cannot be overstated. However, that wasn't nearly, that wasn't apparent until I spent the necessary time learning cinema and post-production and color correction. I had spent 10 years, let's say, prior to that, from my teens to my mid-20s, pursuing music and songwriting and performance. So I had some background with that already, but I realized that I wasn't going to do, be able to do the things I wanted to do by playing music at that point. But I knew that I needed to do something artistic. Found this job, as I described, serendipitously. I got excited about it so much that I changed my entire life, uprooted and went to Los Angeles. And then I didn't really do much with music or songwriting there for a good five, eight years because I was so overloaded with trying to learn my craft. And I got to a point then, because I started, what, 96, almost 25 years ago. I got to a point with, with color where I had sort of done a lot of what I wanted to do with it. And I felt good about the level of, uh, where I'd gotten to. And I found myself with the decline of film in 2010 and the liberation of all of us that used to have to work in these very large uh, studios with spinning wheels and sprockets, all that went away overnight. And it's this desktop thing. And I started having more and more time to get back to that first love of music and songwriting. But the journey through cinema and color taught me all about narrative in a way that I never was catching on to with just music. So then I came back to music and started writing songs for what would be truths. My entire perspective on how to go about writing and arranging a song was based upon how does the movie get put together. Whereas before that had no impact whatsoever. Okay. And then I realized, I, I realized that they're not just the two things that interplay, that it all interplays. Like these two disciplines raised me up and these gave me stereoscopic vision that there's so much more going on out there that it is connected. The storytelling is connected. I think storytelling is kind of a, the top of the pyramid. We tell it with our music or our lyrics or our poems or our movies or our songs. Um, so learning that storytelling is even maybe bigger than entertainment. It's how we teach our, how we teach the young people, the things that we've all learned, you know, without maybe being uh, too orthodox about things, but storytelling. Hey, let me tell you this story. Let me tell you that story and the story and that story. And it helps, helps humanity, I think. And that's what sort of fires me up. The films taught me sort of how to uh, have empathy for an audience or how to organize my musical thoughts in a way that I just probably never would have, who knows, if I had gone and studied music with professionals, maybe. My recent work with some professionals in the last few years would suggest that, but, you know, I found my way another way. 
Uh, well, as the Fly and Karamatov brothers say, it doesn't matter how you get there if you don't know where you're going. So <laughs> you ended up in the right place and you got there through a, through a path that is fortuitously different from what a lot of us went through. Now, am I, now you talked about Truce. People don't know that Truce is your second album. Mm-hmm. And know Your Rights is your first. Am I to understand that Know Your Rights is kind of like a pre-test uh, before you figured this stuff out and Truce is a post-test? That's a... I hadn't thought of it, but that's probably exactly right. That Know Your Rights was made partially in Los Angeles when I was still there on my first trip. I've lived there three times. Um, around 1999, 2000, 2001, finished it in Atlanta at Crawford uh, Communications. And I intended to make a sophisticated adult, you know, uh, record. And of course, it sounded nothing like that. It sounded maybe a tick above, you know, being in the garage with a cassette player. And I was a little bit disappointed. I had thoughts that it was going to be one thing and then it was another. And of course, that was right sort of when my career really took off. So I didn't get back to songwriting and music production for another 15 years. And when I listen to it still, I'm sort of, I like, I I love it. It brings back good memories. I'm proud of some of the songs, but the the technical limitations that, you know, uh, kind of drive me nuts. I can't, I can't sort of, not hear that for some reason. So then with Truce, I decided to do it uh, once again, like an adult, and it might sound sophisticated, but this time I had you know, the benefit of a couple of decades and more resources under my belt. So I was able to hire you know, the session players at Fame Studios and Muscle Shoals and eventually finish the record in Abbey Road. So using people- Did you say that, Abbey Road, Abbey Road? <laughs> Did you say that? I said Abbey Road, that's right. Having professionals from places like that contribute to your record are going to change things drastically from your friends in their basement, you know. Uh, and it does sound better. Not quite, you know, I keep feeling like I'm getting closer and closer to that. But consider that my entire career is refinement of very well-produced content. I refine and refine and refine. You know, I, that's, I don't know if that's a bias or was I always a refiner or have I just been made into a refiner? But a lot of times with the music, it's, it's got to be, you know, still organic, but maybe the next record will get there. Well, let me offer just a little perspective. Having heard both of these records and numerous times, uh, I, I take the liberty of disagreeing with your assessment of Truce being a level above Garage. I, I, I'm sorry, not Truce. Know your rights. I think when I heard Know Your Rights, and hopefully other folks will get it to hear it, you're going to hear what I consider to be a very sophisticated record. It's got, a, it's got a great sound quality to it. The songs are very interesting, full of stuff. Um, what it's missing that Truce has, and I don't think it's to its detriment, I think it's a different record, but Truce definitely has the narrative that Know Your Rights does not. Know Your Rights is just like, what are these songs about? They sure are fun, but I, you know, I'm just kind of on this wild roller coaster ride. And Truce, you were looking for an arc and achieved it, in fact. And I, I guess there's no better way to describe exactly what I've been talking about with this journey than that. Know Your Rights was, I think, a, a nice peek into my imagination that I had started to develop the imagination, but didn't really have any idea how to tell stories or how important that was or... Uh, you know, I, I would even, I was even sort of like, oh, I'm not going to rhyme like that because everybody rhymes like that. You know, and you listen back to it, you're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, uh, take away one of the best conventions we have for lyrics and don't do it. Uh, yeah, and to grow up and to learn stories and kind of get a feel for what I wanted to say. And, you know, it was a personal record and I made it in two segments. Uh, there was a bit of a, a, you know, a personal crisis in the middle that I, uh, I overcame and that the songs at the back end of the record are hopefully even more coherent and this more truth positive. Truth. You're talking yeah. about truth now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the records are personal and obviously, like you said, when you heard it, that the, the know your rights tunes were fun, but what is he talking about? Back then I didn't care. You, you know, I didn't know what I was talking about. Well, it's to your credit that you didn't care because that's what makes it fun. I think if you had cared, it would have felt like a failure. You know, like, oh, uh, you know, he's, there are albums like that that are crazy and, and they just kind of fall. I don't <laughs> feel like 
know your rights was a failure. It was just, you know, you just did your thing. It was part of your learning process and you were satisfied with it at the time. And now you're not, which is. But I don't mean to interject. It's funny <laughs> it's your how, problem. <laughs> how you, how you bring that up. And I don't think of the, the incoherence at all. What I think about is it doesn't sound as good as I wanted it to. So isn't it funny too, how you're so concentrated on one thing. You're like, Oh yeah, it's, it's completely incoherent. I mean, who cares? It sounds good. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I, I did have a thought about that. Uh, so your process of trying to write a story, um, I guess I can attest to the difficulty of telling stories uh, and also the difficulty of, um, well, I guess what I wanted to say uh, was that you said you took out rhyme. Of course, there are some songwriters watching this and, uh, you know, should you be afraid to take out rhyme? Me personally, I have a habit of completely taking away everything that could be helpful to me <laughs> in a project and seeing if I can survive without it. And then yeah. I learn by that how important it is to put that in. When you took out rhyme, I don't think you failed by taking out rhyme. You just made it more interesting. But you did learn why, you, why the rhyme is helpful in a way that somebody that was always afraid to take out rhyme never learns that that's a that's a that's a great point so i suppose that uh it was a much more powerful lesson to learn it myself by being a little nonconformist because i didn't know any different really i identified something that seemed like a pattern and i wanted to not fall into that pattern and, uh yeah and then once again good old film and imagery come through and help maybe help me get away from some of my compulsions within the process, you know, and, and learn some other things while I'm not even realizing that I'm learning other things about storytelling and then bring that back to music and go, Oh, you know, that's why this works. You know, no wonder, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, with, and, and, you know, of course with me, with no education in music past something rudimentary, Yet having a love and an imagination, uh, that was a funny journey to be on because you realize you don't really know what's going on at all. It, that's with, in o, you know, 0102 with Know Your Rights and certainly stepping it up and going to a place like Fame and playing with players who've been on hit records for 40 years and saying, here's my song and I want you to play it like this and, you know, having any credibility whatsoever. None. Uh, but through that process, you get to learn how to produce these great players to where it works for them and you get what you get what you want you brought up an important point um in the case of know your rights your first album you were mostly working with talented friends in the right. case of truce you were working with not only pros but vets we're talking about people that played on some of the records we've been listening to our whole lives and there's something about these musicians that people may not know which is that they're just people and just because they're really great doesn't mean they're immediately going to give you what you want out of your project and it really helps them if your project makes sense to them because if it doesn't they're not they, it's possible that these fantastic players may be of no help to you at all they might not be any more help than your friend in the garage i think that the the biggest thing i learned in the first go around i've worked at at fame i think four times now uh was i was of course I knew what I wanted with my songs, but I sat up in the booth and just kind of listened and was like, that's such an amazing playing that, yeah, I love it. Yeah. And you get back and you listen to the mix. You're like, that's not my song. And, you know, they're so talented that they can make it sound like, you know, if you heard it on the radio and you're like, yeah, put that on my song, but it's not your song. So then learning how to come down to the floor, communicate, have the language. I was asked by the backing singers, is this for a movie? Because you're describing it with such, language that it's you know painting these pictures of the lion and on the main and what he's doing and and so they were picking up on my cinematic uh you know background but no we were just we're approaching this song and here are the emotional uh touchstones along the way and they loved that and they delivered so that was a great moment to be able to get down the floor not be intimidated explain some of the things sit down to the piano play the parts uh and next thing you know, your record starts to come to life a lot more like you. Um, and it, it's fantastic, but I, I still think that's where a, a veteran producer would be a big help. That there's just a lot of 
things going on trying to get your songs through a professional pipeline that are expensive and scary and all kinds of things. And um, I had to kind of learn how to produce on the fly, having someone there with the experience to be able to, look, to convey my thoughts, you know, would be helpful, but it's expensive enough as it is. <laughs> yeah, of course. And well, I guess what I was getting at was that um, having a story like you, this is, we're talking about a song called on the main, which has a story arc to it. The song itself has a story and it was helpful to you and your musicians to have something to talk about in the song that you could both talk about with a song from know your rights. Perhaps the songs were so random and crazy that they had no idea what the song was about. They were just going to go with whatever you said, boss, you know, but with main with on the main, they were like, okay, I hear something here. Is this what you're looking for? And yes, absolutely. A producer can be that person. If you're not articulate in that way, if all you know is if you were to come in there with know your rights and had no idea how to explain what you were doing, a producer would have been a great stopgap and say, here's a story that I hear. Do you like it? Should we talk to the musicians about that? And, and that's, I sometimes wonder if my next go around should be with a producer um, on the path towards whatever it is I'm seeking. You know, I'll know it when I hear it, I guess. But I also feel like I've learned quite a bit along the way. And, and I have to say also, you've been an excellent uh, friend and instructor in music education along the way with me now for a long time as well. So my ability to produce content, send it to you and a few other trusted ears uh, to then let me know what you hear. Uh, I, I'm feeling confident about what I'm doing. Uh, and well, you got me kind of fired up, Adam. I'm going to have to go and start working on a new song. <laughs> well, don't go just yet. I want to talk about a couple more things if, if you're still good. No, I'm good. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, he says, but he's like, I got to go write my song. Hmm, which guitar? <laughs> Wait, come back, come back. Um, a question that occurred to me, um, it sounds like you said to some extent that in the color business, you weren't allowed to, like, had you been on your, like, if you had just been, like, an, uh, given a chance to just go for it without all that professional scaffolding around you as a colorist, do you think you would have given into the temptation like you did with sound to say, well, you know, why do we need red? <laughs> Let's just take out red. Why do we need blue? What would happen? Do you think you would have been that crazy with color? Uh, did the professional scaffolding make a difference or was it the actual change to color and visual that made the difference for you? Well, if I'm hearing this correctly, when I first started as a young colorist, uh, you know, I, I took that job in the middle of the night at age 25. And my, my goal was to be a colorist by 30, so a five-year apprenticeship. And I, I got that just under the gun. And those first sort of five years after that, 99 to 04, uh, color styles in America were hyper aggressive in the late 90s. And those were the pictures that I learned from beginning on. I mean, everything was just contrast crazy and crazy colors saturated out the wazoo. It was all still shot on film. So the film handled all of that in a much more pleasing way, as did CRT televisions, when everyone was watching standard F TV on a tube in their house. That tube smeared and added uh, a vibe, almost kind of like old hi-fi records. So the stuff we were putting out was really funky and over the top. And to, to uh, stake your claim as a colorist that, you know, you should come see me and not those other famous people is that I'm doing something that's out like we're moving red, we're moving blue. Uh, but it's either pleasing or just new enough that it's pleasing and won't, you know, stand the test of time. But in this particular fad and craze, this is what I'm going to do. Um, so I, I was, I was kind of like know your rights in the early days when I was on my own because I did I was just emulating what I saw and I was trying a bunch of crazy. I was doing half black and white, half super saturated, you know, like just <laughs> crazy. Putting pantyhose in the, you know, the lenses, anything you can think of to come up with something new. And that, that all sort of went away, uh, 03, 04, 05, with the advent of flat screen televisions that didn't handle that extreme image all that well. And there was a trend that went away from that towards a very desaturated, very, gray kind of what we call a london school where if you come from an overcast climate your reality is is overcast and diffuse light 
because clouds diffuse the light as well as block it. Uh, so you color diffused and low, the London style. That happened in America for about four years, and then we've kind of come back to either a little bit more aggressive, but now with firmly entrenched flat screens and digital cinema, the, the real sweet spot, I think, for imagery is a lower contrast, more mids, more powdery, less clipped, less crushed, painterly, if you will. Now, granted, I, I love that now. I didn't love it 15 years ago, and I might hate it in 10 or 15 years if I'm blessed to keep doing it. But I think that the technology drove us to change our tastes in content. So what I'm hearing you say is that, yes, when you went into color, your personality reigned and it still did its thing, and that the industry itself helped curb and teach you some things you needed to know just by mother necessity. That might not have happened in music because you – didn't go into the music industry, you went into the color industry and you learned your lessons there. And if you consider that I was learning about storytelling that I didn't know existed, it took a long time to realize that my role in the process was to serve the story that all these people before were working on as well as after, and not just to leave a big thumbprint that I was here with my goofy color combos or outsized ego that, you know, this must look like this. It's my look. And trust me, that exists. Um, and to get out of the way and try to just translate what everyone's trying to say with the story, that took a long time to realize that was my real goal. It wasn't my goal at all in the early days, which once again wraps back around influences truth. And there's a respect for, a, I don't know if it's higher power, but certainly a, a bigger story than the one I was aware of. So it's certainly been the growth of a human being writ in recorded output, broadcast imagery and music, you know? Well, you're talking about, I, I don't know, maybe I think you're actually saying this outright, but if you're not, I want to say it. Uh, it is a temptation for all of us creative people to really want to, to be recognized. And you know, this is a thing for me, of course, to want to be recognized for having made your contribution and want everybody to be able to look at that thing you did and say, mm. oh, there he is, there she is. And you've learned a lesson uh, that there are people that came before you and people that are coming after you that have contributed to whatever it is you think you're working on by yourself, your life. Mm. Um, and that you have a responsibility to those people that came before you in your life on this project that you think is all you and responsibility to the people that are going to receive it after. Uh, and uh, that is, that's really intense. It's a really great lesson for me. Thank you very much for that. Well, yeah, it's certainly been the journey where I think it's just like a lot of things in life. If you stumble enough time, you get beat up enough times, you know, it sort of carries you along. Do you want to go this way? You're going to go this way, but you know, the easy way or the hard way. Uh, yeah, the maturation, but even just in our discussions and being able to compare, like you said, li the life of an artist and the arts that I've been fortunate to be a part of and how they've influenced each other and certainly how they've influenced my take on things outside of the creative arts. Because all once again, if, it all, if it's all about telling stories, um, well, there's a lot of stories that get told out there, you know, uh, telling good ones in, in, in good ways to me is still, uh, I'm, I'm so pleased that I've been able to learn these. And I, I'm excited to see what next as far as discovering new uh, aspects of creativity and thinking that back in 2020 when we were all locked in these rooms that I thought I knew what I was doing and I certainly didn't. <laughs> Who knows what I'm missing, right? Is Are you at a place where you can share these albums with the public that's watching now? Is there a place they can find them? Is that coming later? Is that something you ever intend to do? I know they're hard to find now. Well, they are. They're, they're certainly hard to find as so they're not released in a digital, digital way. And for some reason, I don't know why, the importance of having these things available to purchase have never really been important to me. I've given them away but it doesn't work because a wide audience these days goes to several places and you like to find it. So I suppose I really ought to see these things through and make them available. But I've, uh, it's, not a, it's not that I'm not happy with them. I am. There's something about 
the fact that there's absolutely no sort of home for new songs that I can see that make any difference. You go to iTunes and there's already a billion songs on iTunes. And I think that the companies that like Apple keep the majority of the money for that reason of any that might happen or the streaming. And so I, it feels almost like giving it away. Uh, but I guess I gotta, I gotta get over that. I've never made these records to try to make a living. And so protecting them from the rigors of commerce has been kind of nice. But yeah, it is sort of also silly to be talking about all this and then be like, yeah, no, no, I'm not going to release any of this stuff. <laughs> I, I, I get that. <laughs> we can I talk about that. that, but you can't hear it. I'm sorry. You can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's Don't even look ridiculous. at it. <laughs> but, you know, we've talked about this with a lifetime of, of worldwide broadcast of your work and your personality is in color. I've had my share and my fill of self-promoting. And here's my new reel. Here's my new reel. Here's my new reel. That uh, I've enjoyed these last couple of years with the, with the music of not having to promote it or hype it or anything. So, you know. but Dave, you have a responsibility to the people that come after you and the yeah. people that got you to this place. This music must be heard. <laughs> I can't argue with that. That might be the best <laughs> compelling argument I've heard yet. So I'll make this offer. Folks can contact me directly at adam at grandparkarts.com if you want to make an inquiry about how you can listen to this music. And if I get enough inquiries, uh, perhaps Dave will be convinced to put them in a public place. Um, in the meantime, we'll respect your privacy, Dave. I want to thank you so much for talking with us. It's really been a great, a great conversation. Yes, it has been, Adam. I've I, uh, I think we could go all day, but, um, you know, it's been fun. I appreciate you taking your time to talk to me. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And I want to thank all of y'all for uh, tuning in with us today. Uh, again, I'm Adam Cole with Grant Park Academy of the Arts. Our website is www.grantparkarts.com. You can reach me at adam at grantparkarts.com if you have questions about Dave, about Dave's work, about uh, what we do at the Grant Park Academy of the Arts, or any questions about who you might like to hear on this program. Uh, we are going to be talking with Mr. Jason Bivens next. He wrote a book called uh, uh, Spirits Rejoice about jazz in very surprising ways, and I'm looking forward to talking with him. Also, we'll be talking to Darcy Hamlin, a horn player with the Milwaukee Symphony. So we've got lots of great shows coming up. And our second interview with Steve Espinola is also coming. So see if you can find those videos. Thanks again, everybody, and have a wonderful day.
to be loved.